called the Jesus and Nonviolence Third Way by Walter Wink. Uh, Walter Wink was a professor of biblical interpretation at Auburn Theological Seminary in New York City. Uh, I say was because he sadly has passed away, uh, but I did get to meet him at uh, Princeton University uh, once upon a time for a seminar, and uh, he was a very uh, funny and engaging uh, professor. So the scripture today is uh, from Matthew 5, verses 38 to 41. This may be familiar to you uh, if you've ever heard about, uh, you know, when confronted with evil, turn the other cheek, go the extra mile, uh, give up your cloak or your clothes. Anybody familiar with that? You can raise your hand. Okay, yeah, everybody is. Almost everybody is. So, um, so these verses are part of the Sermon on the Mount, that great collection of Jesus' teachings that Matthew has recorded for us. We know from verses 1 and 2 uh, that uh, when, now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples uh, came to him and he began to teach them. So Jesus is primarily talking to his disciples at this point. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount is a, is a way of life to be pursued by those who are Jesus' disciples. Let us hear the scripture, starting at verse 38. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go to, with him two miles. So this is, this, I, I like to preach on this when I get the opportunity because I think it's uh, probably one of the most misunderstood um, uh, scriptures in the New Testament. So I just like to, to clear the fog. Um, you know, it doesn't seem like we'd be able to achieve justice by, by just uh, turning the other cheek or going the extra mile. What, what, is, what does that do? And what did Jesus mean by all of that? Um, <clears throat> why do not Christians promote nonviolence exclusively? Turn the other cheek is seen as a recipe for passivity and, or submission. Are we to just to dis accept domestic violence, injustice, poverty, slavery, racism, and other human sins? Sometimes people may confuse pacifism with a C uh, from the noun pacific, which means peaceful, calm, or conciliatory, with passivism with a V, which means inactive, not involved, and since they sound so much alike, but they are different words. Many Christians desire nonviolence, yes, but they are not talking about a nonviolent struggle for justice. They simply mean the absence of conflict. Reduction of conflict by means of a phony peace is not a Christian goal. Justice is the goal, and that may require an acceleration of the conflict as a necessary stage in forcing those in power to bring about genuine change. We saw this during the Civil Rights Movement. There, even though the Civil Rights Movement led by Dr. Martin Luther King was nonviolent in, in his uh, actions, there was an acceleration of violence in society during the time of that conflict. So what did Jesus say anyway? I believe Jesus was concerned with both the eternal and the here and now. You may believe that what Jesus taught was not practical, and that one must be a saint or a martyr. Resist not evil, give away your clothes, turn the other cheek, go the separate mile. Does sounds like a prescription for a doormat, not for opposing injustice. 
Yet Jesus didn't act this way. Remember the story of the uh, money changers in the temple? He didn't just uh, say, oh, that's great. You can collect all the money you want. No, he turned over the tables and drove the money changers out of the temple. So Walter Wink asserts that the truth is that when given a fair reading in its original social context, and that's the key, the original social context, these verses are arguably one of the most revolutionary political statements ever uttered. Let's take a look. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. Well, when the court translators in the hire of King James, you remember the King James Bible, chose to translate Antistene, that's a Greek word, as resist not evil, they were doing something more than rendering Greek into English. They were translating nonviolent resistance into submission. It was not the king's advantage to tell people that there was a third option. But let's be clear, Jesus did not tell his oppressors, his oppressed hearers, not to resist evil at all. That would, that would have been crazy talk. And, but that's why the translators re, uh, translated it that way. They said because if they translated it how it should have been, that would have been crazy talk. Authoritarians don't want resistance at any, for any reason. So <clears throat> the Greek word is made up of two parts, anti a word still used in English for the uh, against, and histemi, a verb that in its noun form means violent re uh, rebellion, armed revolt, or sharp dissension. In the Greek Old Testament, this word is used primarily for military encounters, 44 out of 71 times. A proper translation of Jesus' teaching would then be, don't strike back at evil in kind or do not, do not retaliate against violence with violence, or don't react violently against one who is evil. Jesus was no less committed to opposing evil than the anti-Roman resistance fighters. The only difference was the means that he used, how, should, how one should fight evil. There are three generalized responses to evil, passivity, freeze, violent oppression, fight, and a third way, a third way of nonviolent resistance uh, articulated by Jesus. Jesus abhors both passivity and violence as a response to evil. To better understand Jesus' teachings, let's look at the three examples that Jesus gives starting in Matthew 5, verse 39. But I tell you, if someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him also, the other. This, uh, this verse easily lends itself to demonstration. Uh, could anybody would like to volunteer uh, to, be, uh, uh, to get their cheek struck? I, actually, you won't do that. But <laughs> <clears throat> if anybody would like to volunteer to do a little demonstration, uh, please come forward. If not... I'll just explain it, but uh, <laughs> no, I'm not seeing any volunteers. Uh, oh, 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 wait, we have a volunteer. <laughs> yeah, come up here. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so I imagine that most of you would... This is how I imagined it anyway, that, that when someone strikes you uh, on the cheek, you, you go like this, right? Mm -hmm. Boom. Right? Is that, does that comport with your imagination of what we were talking about? One way. Huh? What's that? That's one way. Uh -huh. I, I open hand. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> open hand, like this. Boom. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Any, anybody else have any ideas? No? Okay. But tell me, when I do this, either this or this, what cheek side is that? What is your 
Where is this? I said left side. The left side. Oh, yeah. The left side. Yeah. yeah thank and you. And then I would turn to the right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. So <clears throat> that's the key to this whole scripture. All right. Jesus is, says, and, and it's right there in the, in the Bible. Someone, you know, if someone hits you on the right cheek, turn to him the other. So what does that really mean? He's not talking about a fist fight or, or a slap like this. He's talking, the only way a person in that community, first century uh, Israel, could hit somebody on the right cheek is with a backhand like this, okay? <coughs> because they would always be using their right hand because the left hand is the unclean hand. And you don't use, <coughs> excuse me, the left hand for any other reason other than unclean purposes. So, thank you, sir. You're welcome. God Appreciate bless you. it. God bless you. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> <coughs> so, again, it's not a fist fight we're, we're, that Jesus is talking about, it's an insult. Okay, somebody of higher power, higher authority, is insulting somebody of lower uh, standing. And we have here a set of unequal relations in which, in each of which, retaliation would be suicidal. The normal response would be cowering submission. In every case, Jesus is talking to the oppressed. If someone strikes you, someone sues you, if someone forces you, <coughs> Jerusalem is under a brutal and oppressive Roman occupation. And Jesus' hearers are the oppressed Jews. These treatments are meant to enforce the caste system and keep people in line. But why then does Jesus say to turn the other cheek? Because this action robs the oppressor of the power to humiliate. The person is saying in effect, Try again. You have failed to humiliate me. This creates confusion in the oppressor. What to do? <coughs> now let's move to the second verse from Matthew, uh, second example from Matthew 5, verse 40. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. What is going on in this scene? Well, first a tunic, or sometimes the cloak, sometimes the translations are different. In Luke, it's the opposite way around. If someone takes your cloak, give him your tunic. But the idea is that one of these is meant to be like underwear, and the other is meant to be like their outer clothing. So the cloak, let's say in this example, is a, is a woolen outer robe that was used as a blanket at night. Deuteronomy 24, verses 10 through 13, provide the Jewish law. When you make your neighbor a loan of any kind, you shall not go into the house to take the pledge. You shall wait outside while the person to whom you are making the loan brings the pledge out to you. If the person is poor, you shall not sleep in the garment given to you as a pledge. You shall give the pledge back by sunset so that your neighbor may sleep in the cloak and bless you. Only the poorest of the poor would have nothing but their outer garment to give as, a, as collateral for a loan. Jewish law strictly required its return every, every evening at sunset for that was all the poor had to, in which to sleep. It's kind of hard to get our minds around that concept today. But let me try to summarize the social context. Land is not sold as it is as we do today. It's ancestrally owned and passed down from generation to generation. So the only way to get some land is to force the sale to repay a debt. The tool used here is exorbitant taxes to fund Roman wars high interest rates to, on loans to pay taxes. <coughs> it is in this context that Jesus speaks. His hearers are poor. They share a hatred 
for a system that subjects them to humiliation by stripping them of their lands, their goods, and finally even their outer garments. Why then does Jesus counsel them to give their, over their inner garments as well? This would mean stripping off all their clothing and marching out of court stark naked. In our culture, this strategy would probably be not of much use. However, in first century Judaism, nakedness was taboo and shame fell on the, not on the naked party, not on the person who was naked, but the person viewing or causing one's nakedness. Much different from our context. Now the creditor is revealed to be not a respectable moneylender, but a party in the reduction of any entire social class to landless, landlessness and destitution. This unmasking is not simply punitive, however. It offers the creditor a chance to see, perhaps for the first time in his life, what his practices cause and to repent. Remember now, the creditor is ashamed, not the debtor. And we can also see that Jesus, as usual, is not content just to bring justice to the poor, but to redeem the lost as well. Jesus, in effect, is sponsoring clowning, an honored Jewish tradition. The powers that be stand on their dignity. Nothing deflates them faster than lampooning. By refusing to be awed by their power, the powerless are emboldened to seize the initiative even when structural change is not possible. This message is a practical, strategic measure for empowering the oppressed. It provides a hint of how to take on an entire system in a way that unmasks the essential cruelty and to burlesque its pretensions to justice, law, and order. I know this story is not from our cultural context, and some of you may be saying to yourself, yeah, right, like that would really work. Well, let me re relate a modern day example. Under the apartheid re regime in South Africa, the authorities had for a long time sought to destroy a particular shanty town without any success. Then one day, when most of the men and women had left for work, the army arrived. The soldiers announced that the few women there had five minutes to get their, their things, and then the bulldozers would commence to destroy the town. The women, perhaps sensing that the farm boys, who largely made up the army, stood in front of the bulldozers and stripped off their clothes, and the army fled. Now we'll look at the third example. <clears throat> if someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. This example is drawn from the very enlightened practice of limiting the amount of forced labor the Roman soldiers could levy on subject peoples. Mile markers were placed regularly besides the highways. You probably didn't know that the mile markers on I-95 are carryover from Roman times, did you? <laughs> It is helpful to understand that Roman law limited the soldier to making the Jew carry his pack one mile. Anything more carried severe penalties. Why? In this way, Rome attempted to limit the anger of the occupied people and still keep its armies on the move. Nevertheless, this levy was a bitter reminder to the Jews that they were a subject people even in the promised land. Jesus was keenly aware of the futility of armed revolt against Roman imperial might. But why walk the second mile? Is this not aiding and abetting the enemy? No, not really. The question here, as in the two previous instances, is how can the oppressed recover the initiative? How can they assert their human dignity? And in a situation that cannot be changed for the time being. The rules are Caesar's, but not how one responds to the rules. 
That is God's, and Caesar has no power over that. The soldier expects to get his, back, his pack back at the end of the first mile, and the Jew says, no, I'll carry it another mile. What? Wait, wait, wait. What, why would you do that? What, what's, he, what's this guy up to? Am I going to get in trouble? Uh, he is cheerfully carrying the pack and will not stop. Is he going to file a complaint with my superiors? No, Jesus has counseled the oppressed Jew to take back the initiative, to throw the oppressor off balance and into confusion. These three examples amplify what Jesus means in his thesis statement. Don't react violently against the one who is evil. Instead of the two options ingrained in us by millions of years of unreflective, brute response to biological threats from the environment, fight or flight, Jesus offers a third way. This new way marks a historic mutation in human development. The revolt against the principle of natural selection. With Jesus, a way emerges by which evil can be opposed without being mirrored. The first way, fight, calls forth armed revolt, violent, repress, violent rebellion, direct retaliation, and revenge. The second way, flight, calls forth submission, passivity, withdrawal, and surrender. Jesus' third way calls forth so much more. Seize the moral initiative. Find a creative alternative to violence. Assert your own humanity and dignity. Meet force with ridicule or humor. Break the cycle of humiliation. Refuse to accept the inferior position. Expose the injustice of the system. Shame the oppressor into repentance. Force the powers that be to make decisions for which they are not prepared. Recognize your own power. Be willing to suffer rather than retaliate. Cause the oppressor to see you in a new light. Be willing to undergo the penalty for breaking unjust laws. Die to fear of the old order and its rules. In the Philippines, in 1966, no, I'm sorry, 1986, a dictator was overthrown peacefully because churches, both Catholic and Protestant, advocated the gospel of nonviolence. By election day, a half a million poll workers had been trained who were prepared to give their lives to prevent the falsification of ballots. The Hebrew Bible tells us that in the last days, all nations will go up to the mountain of the Lord, that he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths, that we will beat our swords into plowshares, our spears into pruning hooks. We shall not lift up our swords against nation and neither will we learn war anymore. Friends, that day is coming. Jesus and the gospel, the good news, point the way. Amen.